chapter one, the chemical world. Um, these ones are pretty light on actual, there's not gonna be any real math that you have to do here. But this is kind of conceptual, like getting you into the world of chemistry is realizing that literally everything is made of atoms and molecules. Everything is a chemical. If it's not a chemical, it's not anything. <laughs> it's nothing. Um, so sand can be annoying because it's so small, but it sticks to everything. We've all, I'm sure, been to the beach. Um, but like everything, like I just said, it's composed of tiny, tiny particles called atoms, uh, which are unimaginably small. So single, a single grain of sand contains more atoms than there are grains of sand on the largest beach. More grains of sand on the beach, there are atoms in a single grain of sand. The idea that matter is composed of tiny particles is among the greatest discoveries of mankind or humankind. Um, and actually I think it's really funny the way that humans got there. It was like, all right, if I cut, say I cut this, um, say I cut my, or my MacBook in half, say I cut it in half again. How many times can I cut this in half before I get to something I can't cut in half? And essentially that's where the idea, actually I'm probably skipping ahead in the slides here. That's where the idea of the atom came from. I believe it means something like indivisible particle. So it's the, finally the point where you can't cut it in half anymore. <clears throat> so one of the reasons that chemistry and understanding that everything is made up of atoms and molecules is so powerful is because those atoms and molecules determine the behavior of all matter. Like this table is solid, or this lectern is solid because of the particles that it's made of. The air is a gas because of the particles that it's made of. So if we understand molecules, we can predict the properties or change the properties of anything. So water, for example, is made up of an oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. Um, when it's in this shape, which we'll learn later is a bent shape, it has all of the properties that it does. If it had a linear shape like this, where the hydrogens are directly on opposite sides of each other, sticking out like little arms, it would behave completely differently. I need to revamp these slides because I keep getting ahead. So there's a direct connection between the world of atoms and our molecules that we experience. Chemistry is understanding that connection. It's saying that Water behaves a certain way because it's shaped like this. Water would not behave the same way if it was different. Seems like a really simple thing maybe, but it's very fundamental. So we wanna understand how matter behaves by understanding the particles that make up that matter. It's kind of like sociology tries to understand the behavior of entire populations based on the people who make up that population. So like I said, everything you can hold or touch, actually, well, yeah, because you can touch the air, right? You can touch water, all of it, they're all chemicals. I know that chemical gets thrown around as this word to mean like um, paint thinner or gasoline or these things that are harmful chemicals, but everything is a chemical. If you see, and I will put this question on an exam, if you see is organic or organic vegetables chemicals, the answer is yes. Everything is a chemical, always. Um, yeah. So, you know, not just those chemicals, not just organic vegetables, but water, air, food, medicine, our bodies are made of chemicals. Um, and so in chemistry, we're trying to figure out why these chemicals are the way they are. One of the ways that we've gotten to the point and the you know, level of technology that we have today where we've got this really nice projector and we've got apparently uh, artificially intelligent speakers that declare their presence every 30 seconds uh, is the scientific method. So it's this idea that, all right, if I, <laughs> if I take my Apple pencil, and I drop it, is it gonna fall? Yes. So it's a falsifiable hypothesis. 
So I can do this over and over again, it'll keep happening. And if I held it out and let go of it and it stayed in the air, we say, oh, my hypothesis is wrong. So one of the keys for this, you make an observation, when I drop things, they fall. You formulate a hypothesis, which I guess in this case, we were to extrapolate, be gravity, right? There's some force that causes everything to fall. And then we test that hypothesis by experimentation, right? Go around and drop a bunch of things and see if they fall. <clears throat> I think one of the things to highlight, especially on this slide, is that it's not a rigid procedure that automatically leads to a definitive answer. Um, a lot of times there are more things at play than we're able to see. For example, if you were to go out and drive your car and you wanted to say, all right, if I go to the gas station, if I you know, cough up the big bucks, if I get the 89 octane fuel, am I gonna get better gas mileage versus just getting the 86 or 87? whatever the lowest is. There's a lot of things to consider when you're testing your gas mileage. For example, is it windy? Is the wind blowing with you? Is it blowing against you? Do you have the AC on? Do you have the windows up, the windows down? Are you driving uphill, downhill? Um, is it cold outside? Because your car can perform better when it's cold outside. Uh, is it really hot outside? Have you aired up your tires recently? How much stuff is in the car? So there's a lot of variables. And if you were to do this test and not consider all these things, you wouldn't end up with a definitive answer, but you might learn a little bit more about the things you do need to control for uh, to actually carry out that test. So <clears throat> this is an easy flow chart, very simple flow chart. So we start at the starting point. And that's making an observation. So um, somebody give me an observation. We could use, uh, sometimes it hails when the hail cannons are going off. Um, oh, I know. I feel really terrible when I eat Little Caesar's pizza. So our hypothesis would be that, you know, eating the pizza makes me feel bad um, or makes me feel good and then later makes me feel bad. So we make an observation. I don't feel good every time I eat Little Caesar's pizza. Our hypothesis might be that, you know, well, maybe it's the extra most bestest stuffed crust that's making me feel bad. What if I get, you know, just the regular Little Caesar's um, $5 pizza? So then our test would be to go out and order two pizzas. Well, order one pizza and see if I still feel bad. And we would probably find that, yes, I do still feel bad because I am lactose intolerant, but we wouldn't learn that yet. So then our test would say, no, it wasn't just the extra most best of stuffed crust. There's something else going on. And so we would revise that to say, well, maybe it's just Little Caesars in general and I would not eat Little Caesars and maybe I feel better. And so we would sort of confirm our hypothesis and it's an iterative process, meaning you do it over and over and over again, changing one thing at a time until you finally come up with, well, hopefully come up with an answer. Uh, the other thing that's on this slide is the difference between a law and a theory. So is it on the next slide? So a law, this might come up later, a law, only explains, well, I won't use explains. Um, say it says what's going to happen. That's why it's the law of gravity, right? If we drop things on earth, they fall. A theory explains why. So a theory explains why something happens. So there's, the only one I can think of right now is the theory of relativity, which is really, I mean, I don't think I understand it. Basically, if you move faster, time goes slower. 
as part of it. Um, so if we had, so if there's the law of gravity, we drop things and they fall, the theory of gravity would be something like the Higgs boson particle gives things mass and that attracts each other. All right, so it would explain the underlying why this happens. So the law of Little Caesar's Pizza would be, I eat Little Caesar's Pizza and I feel bad. The theory of Little Caesar's Pizza would be, I'm lactose intolerant and the cheese on Little Caesar's Pizza makes me feel bad. See how that explains why, rather than just saying what's going to happen. Um, theories are a lot harder to come up with than laws, sometimes. So like we mentioned, the first step is to make an observation. And it's, um, well, some, observ some of these can be made with the naked eye. Other of them, you need you know, mile long loops called the, like the uh, Large Hadron Collider to make those observations, uh, which would be a sensitive instrument. <clears throat> but they usually involve the measurement or description of some aspect of the physical world. So an example of uh, sort of a historical observation that was made was Anto Antoine Lavoisier and Marie-Anne Lavoisier, um, who was actually a big part of his research and helped him out a lot. But of course, the 1700s being what they were, Antoine got all the credit. Uh, he studied the combustion, or he studied combustion by burning substances in closed containers. So basically take a glass vessel, put some stuff in there, heated up really hot. So it burned, but nothing could escape. What he observed was actually that the mass of the container didn't change. So when he did this reaction, it weighed the same before he burned it and after he burned it. So our observations lead to the formation of hypotheses, which is a ten tentative uh, explanation. I think actually here, believe that there was some, you can look this up, the theory of like things burning is really weird when you go back to the 1700s. Um, so good hypothesis is falsifiable, All right? We can prove that hypothesis to be wrong. So his hypothesis was that combustion involved the combination of a substance with a component of air. Back then they had, again, it was a weird, they had some weird name for it. They thought it was almost like the spirit of the thing inside, merging with the spirit of the thing in the air, and that's what caused burning. Um, if you want to look at other weird hypotheses, uh, people used to think that garlics made magnets stop working. You rub garlic on a magnet, it would no longer be magnetic. <clears throat> so in Lavoisier's case, though, he can test his hypothesis um, by burning, trying to burn things without air, and see if that changes the mass, see if they still burn. But again, like I was talking about with the um, cars, if you're testing out different types of gasoline to get better fuel mileage, you have to control for all of the variables. Now in his case, actually back then, it probably wasn't too easy to remove all of the air and still try to burn something. Um, but you have to control for these things. Because sometimes you can have an experiment um, that gets contaminated and you may think you've discovered something, you know, that, uh, shoot. Well, let's say like drinking alcohol. Uh, no, it's not a good one. I don't have a good example. Um, let's say you have something you think it's a disinfectant, right? You have essential oils. Let's say you have some essential oils that you bought, thieves or whatever. And you go and you get um, like a couple pieces of fruit coat one peach in the thieves, you don't do anything to the other, you put them in a jar, you leave them for a long time. In that case, they're probably both gonna get moldy, but not because the thieves didn't work necessarily, but because there might be so much bacteria in the peach that it overcomes the, um, the oil. So you have to control for different variables. You might find that the peach was just perfectly preserved. Um, yeah, I don't have a great example for that. <clears throat> Moral of the story being, you have to control for the variables, otherwise your test doesn't mean anything. 
um, but you can keep going back and you keep testing. So a number of similar observations may lead to the development of a scientific law. Again, like dropping things or boiling things sanitizes them. Um, the brief statements that summarize what happened predict future, future observations, um, but they're also subject to experimental testing. Right, so you have to keep testing these things. I mean, this is why way back in the day, people only drank beer or wine. They didn't know that the process of making those things boiled them, that that killed bacteria, and that that is ultimately what made them safe to drink, um, and that it wasn't something else in there. I mean, that's why we have the plague doctor masks, right? The huge beak. They thought that bad smells caused illness. Well, it turned out that bad smells were caused by bacteria eating things. And those bacteria is called the, caused the illness, not necessarily the smells that they created. So through Lavoisier's testing, he developed the law of conservation of mass. He said in a chemical reaction, matter is neither created nor destroyed based on the fact that he burned things and they were the same mass before and after. So everything that was in there stayed in there. <clears throat> so one or more well-established hypotheses may lead to a scientific theory or model. Um, so in some ways, theories are made up of a series of laws that all come together to explain a single thing. So the theory, again, the theories explain observations and laws. So yeah, why did, why was it always safe to drink wine and beer, but not water from the river? Um, because boiling killed the bacteria. So it really provides a model of the way nature is. So in a lot of ways, theories are a lot more powerful because they create these explanations that build on each other and help us better understand the world. And you can use theories, um, you can use theories to predict future behaviors. So you say, based on the shape of water, so if water is this bent shape, if we had another molecule that was roughly the same size and shape, bent shape as water, we would have something that acted similarly to water. So it would have similar properties. We will find later that that is the case. <clears throat> um, but again, subject to experimental testing. So Lavoisier's law that matter is neither created or destroyed eventually led to John Dalton's atomic theory. So these atoms were just being uh, rearranged, separated and rearranged. Um, but yeah, that, that all matter was composed of small indestructible particles called atoms. So when you burn something, you're just rearranging those atoms. And a law states what happens, arises from observations, may prove to be false. And a theory tries to explain why things happen, but also arises from hypotheses, um, may also prove to be false, and gets as close to the truth as science can get. So actually to highlight this point about may prove to be false, like you can't say a non-falsifiable hypothesis would be, um, Basically, if you say that you can't prove a negative, say that all humans die, you can't prove because you'd have to observe every single human and watch them die. <laughs> and it's just not possible to do that. So somebody can say that, somebody can say, oh yeah, I, this, this is true. You say, well, there's no way to test for that. Um, so as close as we can get, is um, these theories that are based on things that we can say that, no, we proved that this is the case. We were able to say, like, if this test failed, then it would be false, but this test has never failed.
All right, so which of these statements most resembles a scientific theory? I'm going to work on something so you can vote on your phones, kind of like you play Jackbox games. Anyways, well, there will be a way you can vote on this anonymously and we can go over it. But so when the pressure on a sample of oxygen gas has increased 10%, the volume of the gas decreases by 10%. The volume of gas is inversely proportional to its pressure. A gas is composed of small particles in constant motion, where a gas sample has a mass of 15.8 grams and a volume of 10.5 liters. Which of these most resembles a scientific theory? What was that? A. So when the pressure of a sample of oxygen is increased 10%, the volume of gas decreases by 10%. So it's closer to a law. Thank you for participating though. Thank you for your uh, guess. Um, because it's, it's saying that something happens. So if we do this thing, this other thing happens, but it doesn't explain why. So theory is gonna explain why. Do you have a guess down here? Yeah, so C. So C, rather than just sort of listing individual facts, I mean, it's still a fact. Instead of describing a specific scenario, it's saying in general, all particles or all gases are composed of small particles in constant motion. Yeah, so C here is the theory. <laughs> Are atoms even real? Um, yeah, so you can actually, they've done this. I don't remember what kind of microscope this is. I think it's a scanning electron microscope. But they wrote uh, in kanji, the Japanese characters, uh, atom written with individual atoms on a copper surface. So early scientists such as Lavoisier and Dalton saw patterns in a series of related measurements and a set of measurements constitutes scientific data. I think one of the most famous quotes from uh, Mythbusters, which I think was a quote from somewhere else, is that the difference between science and messing around is writing stuff down. So if you're collecting data, you can technically call it science. Um, so I think one of the most important things that we get out of this chapter um, I mean, scientific method is very important, but most practical things is learning to analyze and interpret data. Um, a lot of it is sort of, it's a learned skill. It's something that you have to practice and you'll do a lot of it in the labs. Let's pretend for a second that we're an early chemist trying to understand the composition of water. So we know it contains the elements hydrogen and oxygen, uh, but we do some experiments in which we decompose different samples of water and we get these results. Does anybody notice a pattern in the data? Any pattern at all? Right, it keeps growing. So if we have our massive, um, I don't know why I'm pointing, I have it here. So right for A, B, and C, every time we get increase the mass of the water sample, the mass of our hydrogen and our oxygen also increases. Yeah, that's one pattern kind of follows the nothing is created or destroyed. Uh, any other patterns? So the mass of the hydrogen form uh -huh. and the mass of the oxygen form together combined to see the mass of the water. What is it? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, exactly, right? So we're not destroying any of the water or the hydrogen or oxygen atoms, they're all still there. Um, one of the tricks that you can use is just kind of start dividing numbers. So if you divide one number by another, you get a proportion, right? So you can say that there's this many times more of one than the other. So in this case, if we take our mass of oxygen formed and divide it by the mass of hydrogen formed, is that my calculator here? So we'll take, oh, sorry, other way around. Do 17.8 divided by 2.2. Write that. We'll get 8.09. 8 Let's round that off there. 
And then if we do 44.4, so I guess part of the point I want to make here too is that, so there's eight times as many uh, oxygen atoms as there are, or as massive oxygen as there is massive hydrogen. If we do 44.4 divided by 5.6, then we'll get, that's here, 44.4 divided by 5.6, we get 7.93, so I rounded that one up. And then we'll do the last one. So that's right, almost exact, almost the same. 88.9 divided by 11.1. Oops. 88.9 divided by 11.1. That's 8. 8.01. And there's a little bit of wiggle room in there. And for most, Actually, I won't even say most, for all of the experience, experiments that we are going to do especially, there's always a little bit of wiggle room, but it's about 1%, uh, or it's a few percent maybe of our total answer. So the other pattern that's hidden in here is that no matter what mass of water we decompose, we'll get roughly the same ratio or almost exactly the same ratio between the mass of oxygen and the mass of the hydrogen. So this was, I think this is the first slide. Yeah, so this is the pattern that's less obvious, right? So we do this division, we see that the ratio is the same. There's always eight times the mass of oxygen. <clears throat> um, yeah, seeing patterns in data requires uh, creativity. But this does lead to one of the other, is this next slide? No, okay. Well, at least to one of the other things that we're gonna cover that molecules always form in the same ratio. So our water is always, one oxygen, two hydrogens. And we'll learn that the reason that we get this uh, eight to one ratio, eight times as much, is because of the masses of those individual atoms. <clears throat> the other thing that you need to do for this class is um, interpret graphs. So it may have been a while since you've read a graph. So this is data uh, levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide graph against year. So you can see that it goes up. Um, and so you got to check the x and the y axis. Actually, was there a specific example? <clears throat> yeah, so one of the things to note here is that it doesn't always end in zero. Right, so here we're starting at, I don't know, just under three or 290. So this would be 290. And I know that this tick mark is 290 because if I look at the ones above, this is 300, this is 320. So the number in between them should be 310. So I guess, yeah, if it's been a long time since you've done graphs, those markings will always be consistent. So if every jump in here, come on, if every jump in between here is 10, it'll be 10 all the way up. Same with down here, if this is 860, this is 1900, the tick mark in between them, so let me take a guess, 1880. Yeah, so it's just halfway in between. So if we wanted to look at this graph, and graphs are good for showing trends, right? So we can see that starting here and going to here, we have an increasing trend. Um, they're not so great for getting very specific information. For example, if we wanted to know, um, let's say in 1940, what was the level of atmospheric carbon dioxide, we would first start at this line, draw it up to here, and see that that is our 310 line. But this line doesn't end exactly on a crosshatch. So it's somewhere in between. And so you have to make an estimate of what it actually is. So I think this was in million parts per million CO2. So for 1940, it's like 311 parts per million, maybe 312. Um, and actually in next, oh, it was next week's lab or the week after, we'll have a lab where we, uh, talk about estimating those things because you do need to do a lot of that in this class. <clears throat> Just reading off 
uh, instruments. What time does this class technically end? Somebody know? 610, 615. <laughs> All right, it's okay. Half of, well, actually a lot more than half of you have lab after this. Uh, Monday lab was more popular. So how did it succeed? I think um, one of the things is just be curious about things, right? Like just try, try to be interested, which is a weird thing to say. It's like hard to like make yourself interested in something. But if you keep asking questions, I think you'll hit a point where you like start to actually be interested. Um, watch YouTube videos. Um, I'll put up actually, I think, every, does everybody know who Hank Green is? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll post some of his videos on YouTube. Um, he has a, it's an old series now, but still relevant called Crash Course Chemistry. And he gives really quick 10 minute overviews of topics. So if you go through those, it's a whole series, covers everything we're gonna cover this, in this class and more. Um, he's really good at explaining things, um, but it'll give you a good overview. So, oh, be willing to do calculations. Uh, a lot of times, and I know because I did this all the time, try to take shortcuts, right? Like I don't have to write this out. I can do, you know, I can do this part in my head. It's fine, whatever, don't do that. Write it all out. Go buy a, a ream of paper or go to the, um, how there's, there's like a print lab here, where they do the printing here on campus. Just ask them if you can have some paper. It's gonna help you so much to write everything out. Buy a small whiteboard. Just don't be afraid to use a little more pen, a little more paper, a little more pencil and just write things out. Um, because if you write it out, then you can go back and look and see where you made mistakes. You can send it to me and I'll help you figure out where you were misunderstanding. Um, that's kind of the, probably one of the number one things. <clears throat> uh, the other one being critical thinking. So critical thinking or metacognition is thinking about thinking. Um, it's where the word meta comes from, but try to ask yourself, literally ask yourself questions when you're working on assignments. So on a graph like this, right? If I asked you to find at 1980, what, what is the uh, level of carbon dioxide in 1980? And you can't remember how to read a graph, Google it. Literally just type into Google how to read a graph. Somebody's got an explanation out there. Um, how to use a calculator. Any of these things, you type them into Google, there's going to be an answer out there. If that doesn't work for you, then you can ask, well, I won't say then you can ask me. You can also ask me. <laughs> I don't want to push you away from asking me questions. Please ask me questions. Um, yeah, be willing to ask questions, be willing to work on things, be willing to let your brain hurt sometimes when you're trying to think about a problem. If your brain's hurting, your brain's working. <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. This quote by Roald Hoffman, I like the idea that human beings can do anything they want to. They need to be trained sometimes and they need a teacher to awaken the intelligence within them. And I'm not claiming to be that teacher necessarily, but to be a chemist requires no special talent, I'm glad to say. Anyone can do it with hard work. I believe that all of you can do this class especially and could probably do way more. And I think if you believe that you can do the thing, then you are going to be more committed to trying it. There's this whole thing where um, like in record, different records for like land speed record. Like the first time somebody went like faster than 50 miles an hour, people were like, oh, you can do that. Like the first, like when the Wright brothers made a plane, all of a sudden everybody was trying to make planes. And so it's like, once you know that a thing is possible, it makes it a lot easier to go and do it. So if I didn't know that I could connect my iPad to my MacBook and then put it on a projector, I didn't have to like spend a lot of time writing on the whiteboard. I wouldn't know I could do that wouldn't try to figure it out. So you are capable of completing this class. I think you're all capable of getting a B or an A. But it's gonna take a lot of work. And I definitely think all of you can pass. So you can do it. Um, oh, that's a, I mean the, yeah. Also all the uh, homework problems are odd problems. So the answers are in the back. 
I would suggest don't look at those until you've tried them like three times. <laughs> Try them three times first. Then you can look at the answer. <laughs>